Hello. I am doing this just for you. This is a spiritual message. This is a message that I believe that God wanted me to send to you. Now, that's a whole other issue of why I think that way. But I want you to know that you're loved. I want you to know that if it was possible, I would give every good thing that I have been given by God and I would reach through and I would give it right to you. I don't think that's the way it works, though, because I've preached. I've done missionary work. I've been a taxi driver. I've done carpentry. I've done a lot of things, but um, my identity is I'm, I'm a child of God. I am an artist, and I marvel at the Lord. That That's how I identify myself. When I was about 25 years old, it was my first preaching job. This was my first my first time I was speaking in front of this this crowd. There was a bunch of religious questions that came up, and what I realized as a young man, you know, I had old people and uh, young people and all kinds of everybody was asking me questions, and they wanted to know where where I was on some of these questions, and you know, based upon how I answered it, you know, I would get approval on on what my answer was, or I would see that somebody might have a conflict with me later because that's what, that's how religion is y'all. Religion is a bunch of questions that have binary answers. Yes or no. Um, do you believe it this way or do you believe it that way? And I'm here to tell you that's a lot more complex than that. I believe that, um, faith is conveyed by oral tradition more or less it's something that that is shared from person to person the scriptures say from faith to faith and i'm taking my faith today and i'm trying to share it with you that's what i want to do with this and i don't know how it works but i know that the lord through his spirit does it somehow and so i have faith i have a lot of faith Actually, I have a little faith, and I just make do with what I got. But what I do believe, I want to I want to share it with you, and I, and I hope that it blesses you. Um, I've done several of these series, and whatever whatever it is that you like, please look through and figure out what's good for you, what direction you might want to go, and. Um, I just want you to know that I, I, I do care for you, and this is coming out of love. And I don't know everything, but I, I want to share some good things that might help your journey along. I want to start out by saying that there's this model I want to share with you, James Fowler's uh, Stages of Spirituality. Now, this helped me out a lot. The reason it helped me is that it kind of gave me some kind of an illustration to think about for this process because this this process can be described by a few steps or a few questions I should say what do you do when you start finding something out that's different when you look at the bible from what everybody around you is teaching what do you do how do you navigate this step and how do you get on the journey to figuring out what you believe and, and how you can get to a place of peace. And so the biggest question and the biggest answer is this, what do you really want? And from a spiritual perspective, this is the main question and I could rephrase it to say, do you really want what God has for you? And if your answer to that is yes, then you can continue with all this because your journey is secure. Um, you may not get all the answers that you want, but if you can answer yes to do you want what God has for you, then I believe that he is faithful and he's going to give you what you need. And 
I might not be able to answer your questions. I might not give you anything that even helps you beyond that. But if you can answer the question, do I want what God has for me? Then you are on a wonderful road. You are on the path of seeking. And the Lord said that if you seek, you're going to find. If you ask, you shall receive. You knock, it's going to be open to you. So you are on the way. Um, When I looked at this model from James Fowler, I'll try to show it to you on the screen or something. But uh, what helped me about it is, you know, if you read through it and see where everybody is on this path, you know, one is for like developing children. Two is kind of like starting to bring every, all the pieces together. Three is where most people are who practice a faith in any kind of way. But then there's a questioning stage. I think it's stage four. And when you get to that question stage, what it reminds me of is growing up, going to Sunday school, and you had that one kid who always asked one too many questions. It might have been too deep for the teacher to be able to handle, or it might have just been one too many. But you know what I'm talking about, the kid who asked too many questions. And it was like on a deeper level than everybody else. And, um, and that's what I think brings you to this journey is, is that you might be asking some deeper questions and you might be confusing some of the people and people don't know why you just can't shut up and just take it like everybody else. And, uh, you know, you might be experiencing some people who aren't living like they should. And, you might feel like you have to leave the church to find Jesus. And um, I'm not here to make you, you know, give you any kind of reasons to go back to church, but I'm here to point you to God. I'm here to tell you that God has got you under control and he can handle your problems. He can handle whatever you have that, feels like it's a burden he's got that and he is adequate to help let me share a few more things with you and i think that something that you'll get into is once you start asking a bunch of questions is you're going to see that there's some things that that rise up that seem to be more important and you might be upset that somebody isn't talking about it but because there are some important things like for instance if you look at Ephesians 4, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father above all, through all, and in you all. And that's kind of like the the main topics. And there's a few things that you might talk about on a local level that don't really match any of the main things. Put the main things on your front burner. I think some of the main things are stuff like Romans 4.21. When I was digging through the scripture for my first time, uh, this really jumped out to me as the definition of faith. I never really understood Hebrews 11, 1 and as the definition of faith. It just seemed like it was just saying words, but I didn't understand them. But I understand this. It said that God is able to do what he promised. That's a good definition, isn't it? God is able to do what he promised. And, and to me, that is believing in God that He's going to he's going to complete his work. He's going to do what he says. And that gives me a lot of hope. Matthew 6:33, seek and you will find. There are some groups that have things called creeds. And what you'll what you'll want to do is is you you want to look at what the creeds are and look at the things that the history of Christianity has said these are the most important things. That, that's essentially what a creed is. I was taught that we don't have a creed. We just go by the Bible. But that same group that taught me that also taught a lot of things that I've heard called distinctives. And what a distinctive is, is what makes your group different than all the rest. Matter of fact, I did a, a, a Google search the other day on distinctives. 
And I think the Baptists talk about that a lot. And they, they have a list of things. You can look up a list of the distinctives of the Baptist church. And uh, I, th I think the group that I grew up in, it, they, they're a little bit more uh, not published like that. They don't come out and say it. But denominations, the reason that they're there is because somebody said, oh, no, this is the important stuff. And somebody else says, oh, no, that's not important at all. And people arguing about what those things are is what makes all your different denominations. You know, I grew up in a in an environment that didn't call themselves a denomination and claimed to not be denominational. But whether you're denominational or non-denominational denomination, there are rules that are common to the whole house. That's from C.S. Lewis. This is one of the things that, that helped me more than anything. I read the opening to Mere Christianity, the, just the introduction. He has this illustration about the Great Hall. Now, have you ever heard that joke about you go to heaven and there's a little room over there and then you say, shush, be quiet. Those people are, are in the Church of Christ. They think they're the only ones here. You know, that's kind of like the outcome of the denominational distinctives. We think we're the only ones that are going to heaven. But what this illustration that C.S. Lewis brought up, he said, I'm trying to introduce people into mere Christianity, into the simple facts of what I've been calling the creedal things, that there are some simple matters of Christianity that are very important that pretty much everybody has to acknowledge, you know, God, the father. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are fundamental elements. In this great hall are small rooms. I, I can read the whole thing to you. Matter of fact, I did a video on it. Please go look at it and read it for yourself. And something else C.S. Lewis said was, if it doesn't help you, leave it alone. But another thing he said to one of his students one time is, uh, you are not alone. That's one of the main things I want you to know right now is that you are not alone in this journey. You're not alone in uh, any kind of bad talk that people have given you. You're not alone in a struggle. You're not alone in wandering around feeling like you're not good enough or wandering around or feeling like you're seeking God alone because you're not. That is a trick of the devil to make you think that you're alone. One of the things that I want to share with you is, is something that I've done in my life that has made a lot of difference. And a lot of times people who are connected to churches are, are going to be rallying you for their congregation or their belief systems. It's going to be hard inside the walls of the church to find such relationships, but you can always go fishing there for these relationships. And what these relationships are is like a mentoring relationship. Um, I've had some everywhere I've, I've gone. I've had s some of these relationships, Valdosta and Anchorage and Ukraine and Memphis. Everywhere I go, I find somebody to share good things with, whether I'm a teacher or whether I'm learning from them or whether we're contemporaries. That's an important relationships to have where you where you put God in the center, right? Because you can get it, get together with your friends and, and you could talk about stuff all day long, but putting God in the center on purpose is is the thing that will help your spiritual life and their spiritual life. So find somebody to have these conversations with. When I when I met my friend Jim, there had been a few of us that were already meeting for coffee on Friday mornings and uh, we would get together and talk about just about everything and occasionally we would pray and talk about the Lord a little bit and then Jim came around <laughs> and he just about wouldn't have small talk and he would direct the conversation all the time towards something on God and sometimes you, you need a catalyst like that somebody that'll put the Lord right there in the conversation if you need a little help with that I've got, I've got something that might help you. There's a thing called Life Transformation Group, and there's a whole book on it, really. But it's a simple principle. It's it's so simple that you just get together and you talk 
through these questions with with people who agree to have these meetings. You read the Bible and ask these questions, and it puts God in the center of the conversation. But to have these intimate relationships, it does us several things. You know, however you interpret where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I'm with them also. Or don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Always encourage one another and spur one another to good works. Confess your faults to one another. All of these are good reasons to have small meetings. Two or three other people of the same gender as you, probably the best track to get in your spiritual life into a shape that will grow you closer to the Lord and grow other people closer to the Lord too which is the reason why we're here. If you don't know what your purpose is in life, here it is in two steps. Get to know God, and it's a process. You're, you're getting to know God, and share that process with somebody else. That's what I'm trying to do with you here, and that's what I think our life is all about. So with the Lord leading us like this, we can't go wrong, can we? I originally intended this to give to other people who are coming from the Church of Christ and who feel like they can't talk to anybody else. You can talk to me, I I assure you, because I've been down that road before. And like I said, you are not alone. I've already recommended a few things, and I want to kind of put everything right here in one place for you to uh, use as a bibliography, so to speak. Dallas Willard, that's a name you want to know. He wrote a book called Divine Conspiracy. It was one of the books that changed my life. The Divine Conspiracy changed my life. It it helped me realize that what I was seeing and reading in the scripture, I thought was, you know, had a limit to it. Oh, I've already read that before. But Willard showed me that it was more like an iceberg. And I had just started seeing the tip and everything else down beneath is the depth of it and it's way bigger and better there's a Kierkegaard quote that says uh that that christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers and i went through stages in my life where i liked calling other christians scheming swindlers because i i felt like i detected that they were pharisees and i was pharisees they weren't being honest and i hadn't always been honest so anyway i I liked that quote i'll share that with you lagarde smith uh, wrote a book a few years ago called radical restoration Um, there was a guy named brian mashburn who wrote a manifesto for people like us who are searching and uh, it was called being becoming truer there's another book that I haven't read, but uh, Flavel Yakely is an old school COC guy who used to compile a big handbook on all the churches around the nation. And he wrote a book called Why They Left. There's another author. His name is Robert Myers. And he wrote in a book called Voices of Concern. He wrote about leaving the Church of Christ. So there are pieces of literature on both doors that people are taking, one entry door and one exit door. So uh, if it'll help you, you could read those. There's a book called uh, Exit Interviews, a guy about leaving the church. uh, There's a guy named David Kinneman who is on the George Barna group and he wrote a book called You Lost Me, and it, it, it's about people thinking about exiting the church. And then there was another one called It's You, Not Me, Why More and More Ministers Are Leaving Churches of Christ. And that was an article uh, by a guy named Palmer who had it on his blog back in 2014. If you want to have some fun, There are ways that you can take a denominational test and see what you believe about this and that and the other, and it'll tell you what church you belong to. And then there's some that are kind of funny like like these. And uh, I'll leave you a couple of things like tips on reading scripture, my personal testimony, if that'll help you any, to let you know that you're not alone. Um... 
I have a, a, an experience of shopping for churches. Like if you have a, a spiritual fire, you don't want to let it burn out. You you want to stoke it, stoke it while the the fire is hot. You don't want to let it burn out because when it all comes down to it, we still got Mark chapter four where the parable of the sower. You don't want to be the seventy five percent of the people who either get it snatched away, choked out, or burned up. You know, you want to be the one that that finds the soil that thrives and. I'm letting you know that you're not alone. I'm letting you know that, that I want, you know, I'd give you everything if I could. And I just want to encourage you and show you these few little things that I've been able to share with you in this message that you're not alone and, and there is a pattern and find somebody that will help you walk through this journey. And, um, I'm always down for conversation and, you know, I'm always wanting to help people and point to the Lord like that woman at the well. So I'm going to sign off and give you all these resources to to wrestle with. And, and I wish you all the best and love you. And um, let me pray with you. Father, thank you for reaching out to us first. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for your love and kindness to give us Yeshua, the Messiah, your son that, that you have put us into. We don't understand it, but we believe it. And we want to experience all the goodness of abiding in Christ. Lord, we know that there's a lot of people around us that don't understand our journey, but there are a lot of people who do. There are good people found everywhere who are willing to help our journey. There's also a lot of people who would trip us up. So we pray that we stay on the path of seeking your face. And we know that you will not let us down. And we pray that that you will keep the evil one from, from snapping our heels, especially so that we may know you more that we may seek your face, that we may know the life of Christ intimately right here as we give ourselves as a sacrifice daily to you, God, in the name of Jesus, in his blessings, in his in His holy blood, we, we pray. Amen.